Hi, I'm Carl Herzog, public historian for the USS Constitution Museum. A lot of people are spending more time at home these days, uh, stocking up on groceries and doing more cooking at home. Staff of USS Constitution Museum is no exception to that, which is part of what inspired our USSCM Bake Off this week. We're encouraging people to check out the recipes that we have on the USS Constitution Museum's website and give them a try yourself and share the results in photos or videos. On our website, you can find all kinds of recipes that were used on the ship during the time it was actually sailing uh, by cooks for the US Navy. Unlike the grocery shopping that you might be doing, however, the Navy had to buy for 450 crew members for voyages as long as six months at sea. A little bit more than what you're probably spending on your weekly trip to the grocery store. And they were doing all this at a time when there was no refrigeration. So if you have already started to take a look at our Bake Off, you might be wondering why the recipes are the way they are. A lot of them seem to include some kind of odd ingredients by today's standards, and a lot of them require some fairly long cooking times. Today I want to take a couple minutes to share with you a recipe that I tried out earlier this week, and as well as explain a little bit about what the circumstances were that cooks on board USS Constitution were operating in 200 years ago. For starters, is to consider how many people they were cooking for and what was required of that. Here we see the stove or camboose that's currently on board USS Constitution. This was probably put on board USS Constitution around the 1870s, and it's been altered somewhat since then, but it still gives you a pretty good idea of what a cook on board the ship was dealing with. The front section that we're looking at includes space for roasting things, but truly the primary function of this stove is to boil water. The reason for that is because the vast majority of the food that the crew were eating were salted for preservation, and in order to get the salt out of them and cook them back, or reconstitute them as it was called, demanded boiling them for extended periods of time. In this depiction from the USS Constitution Museum's website, we can see the other side of the camboose where the boilers are located. The food was stored down in the hold along with the water, and each day the requisite amounts that were needed for the crew were brought up and the food was cooked. Again, because these beets were salted, it had to soak and boil for a fairly extended amount of time, several hours. You'll see also on the recipes that we've included on the website that that's a similar pattern for some of the other cooking instructions that are included. Even things like the plum duff that are consisting, consisting of flour and some other things mixed together are put in a bag and then again boiled in water just like the meats were uh, to soften them up over time. The one thing all this food has in common other than having to be boiled was that it was all incredibly dense in calories. If you think you're eating more while you're stuck at home right now, you'd probably be astonished at how much the average constitution sailor was eating at the time. The average sailor was having a calorie intake of about 4,000 calories a day. Now, they were actually burning this off through all of the heavy work that they were doing between climbing the rigging, working on deck, manning guns, uh, other assorted work on board the ship. So they were definitely burning it off, but they were packing on those calories. This graph shows an indication of how those calories were broken down in terms of the amount of what kinds of food each sailor was eating over the course of a week. You can see that the primary thing listed as bread, but then beef, pork, flour, uh, suet, uh, fat, and other uh, items such as peas, rice, molasses were all incorporated into the diet. This graph, by the way, is extracted from a publication called Food and Drink in the U.S. Navy that was produced by USS Constitution Museum staff and is available for download as a PDF on the museum's website. That paper goes into a lot more detail about how food was acquired and set up. And if you're really interested in taking a deep dive into the subject, I definitely recommend downloading our PDF. So again, as we can see from this chart, bread makes up the bulk of, if you will, of the diet of a sailor over the course of an average week, coming in at about 98 ounces of bread over the course of the week. Now, the thing to keep in mind, though, 
is this isn't bread like you're buying at the grocery store. In fact, it's not pre-made bread at all. So we're not talking about 14 ounces a day of fluffy yeast and uh, baking powder kind of bread. This is ship's biscuit or hardtack. Essentially, just flour and water mixed together in a way that would be able to easily preserve and last for a very, very long time. You can find a ship's biscuit recipe as one of the recipes on our website. And earlier this week, I took my own stab at making some ship's biscuit. So here's my ship's biscuit. I ended up making two of them, one a little bit larger and the other one a little bit smaller, but they're both frankly, probably not historically accurate. They did come out kind of hard, but not as hard as they probably need to be. I'm not sure the inside's completely dried out, even on the smaller, thicker one. I used fork tines to poke holes in them to help air out and dry out the inside, but that wasn't really historically accurate because the fork tines are too close together. And on original ship's biscuit, we can see that there were individual holes poked in the top instead of multiple tines on a fork. Yes, that's right, I said original ship's biscuit. This example that is on display on the USS Constitution Museum was believed to have actually been baked in 1854 and was part of a batch served on board USS Constitution in 1861. This stuff really can last that long. It's truly just flour and water. The advantage to that was that it was a way to create really dense uh, bread that could be stored and kept over long periods of time. The downside is, like everything else, it needed to be soaked up in some sort of liquid, water, or broth in order to get soft enough to cook. So, with each sailor eating 98 ounces of this stuff every week, it meant that the ship had to carry more than 84,000 pounds of this stuff to feed all of the 450 crew members over a six-month cruise. Now, given the average size of each one of these biscuits, based on the historical examples that we've found like this one, we think that meant that the ship was carrying more than 337, nearly 338,000 of these little biscuits. That meant someone on shore was manufacturing all of these, baking all of them, ahead of time before the ship left. Provisioning the ship was an entire separate industry that fed the U.S. Navy. In this chart, again drawn from the paper available on our website, Food and Drink in the U.S. Navy, we can see the provisioned loadout projected for a six-month cruise during the War of 1812. This shows two separate columns, what was expected to be the full loadout of food that would be required for that six-month time period, and how much the ship actually had on board at the time that it was sailing. So as we can see, there were some discrepancies between what was expected and hoped for and what they were actually carrying, which often meant that either they weren't going to be able to have enough to last out over a six-month cruise, or they were expected to get more on a rotating basis at some other port stop. All of this food was stored in barrels of various sizes down in the ship's hold. In addition to the food itself, there was water. About 47,000 gallons worth of water was stored down in the hold for a six-month voyage. Now, they would go through 47,000 gallons of water, but they wouldn't empty out an entire barrel uh, or the entire hold. They were constantly looking to keep those barrels full. These particular barrels that held the water were called tons because they literally carried a weight ton of water. And that weight uh, helped, the water helped support the stability of the ship as it was underway and sailing, particularly in heavy weather. So frequently through the ship's logbooks, we hear stories about Constitution stopping and looking for water in various ports and stops along the way. The rest of the food tended to be carried in smaller barrels of various sizes and a diverse range of kinds of oddball names, including from hogsheads to barrels to casks, all the way down to small little firkins. As I noted, 
Each day, the food that was needed for a specific meal was brought up from the hold. In some cases, this meant bringing an entire container or barrel of a specific type of food up, but often because some of the barrels, particularly in the case of water, were so huge, they weren't actually brought up from uh, the hold, but rather small quantities were extracted from those barrels and brought up to the galley and to the camboose for cooking. Once all the food was cooked, it was served out to the crew. The officers ate by themselves uh, in a uh, wardroom, but the rest of the enlisted crew ate, as I said, in small groups called messes. The crew actually got to choose who wanted to be their messmates, and they would gather around, store all of their eating utensils and things in a, in a shared chest, and then always gather and eat their meals together. This kind of camaraderie helped break up the day and became part of the social structure of the crew as well, just like meals today. So as you get back from the grocery store this week and gather around the table for a meal, I hope you'll remember the original crew of USS Constitution and give a little bit of thought to what they were eating and how they were living on board. Their menu was different because they didn't have refrigeration, but the amount of food that they had to carry for a six-month voyage was probably a lot more than you're bringing home from the grocery store, and a lot more difficult to store and to cook. And don't forget that if you want to join along and see what that food was really like, you can join our USSCM Bake Off, try some of these original recipes for yourself, and share with us the results of how they turned out. Hopefully yours will be a little bit better than my ship's biscuit. By the way, the current crew of USS Constitution, still living at the Charlestown Navy Yard, also has their own culinary Navy specialists that are continuing to serve the current crew of USS Constitution, but with the benefits of refrigeration and a lot shorter window in which they have to plan for, that crew eats really well. <laughs> Thanks for joining us again this week. If there's questions you have about the material we talked about this week, or you have ideas for other videos you'd like to see, don't hesitate to post either of those in any of the USS Constitution Museum social media. Thanks again. Enjoy your meal.